Amen. Let's be seated. God bless you. We have all come to Jesus, and as we have heard in the lesson, he's not going to condemn us. He's going to justify us. He's going to forgive us. He's going to save us. He's going to make sure that our names are written in the book of life. We listen to that solo now. Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. By the crowd of worshippers, sorry for their sins, was a poor wanderer rudely brought in. Scribes came in the Pharisees, anxious to see what the meek Nazarene world it will be. Need I dry on? Precious words divine from the lips of mercy, like the sweetest chai. Wonderful ways of Jesus, sing them more and more. Need a quake on them, go and see no more. They told all our wandering, making each love. Talk of the punishment caught in the law, writing upon the ground sadly and slow. Barrel said he only daily had bending low. Still cried the Pharisees, pray, master, pray. What shall we do to her? What but thy said? They said, He rebuke in thee, let thou first stone. Come from the sinner's eyes, haze and alone. Need I dry condemn thee, precious words divine. From the lips of mercy, lie the sweetest child. Wonderful ways of Jesus, sing them more and more. Need I dry condemn thee, go and see no Thank <laughs> you. 
I return to the text of our lesson, the Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter, reading again verse 7. John chapter 8, verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. I like to marry that text with um, the same word of Jesus in the book of St. Matthew, the seventh chapter. I like to read that statement of Jesus with another statement of Jesus in the book of St. Matthew, chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. These two verses of the scripture, they are very pertinent, they are very important. And you may be wondering, this lesson is such a straightforward lesson, why taking the time to dwell on a lesson that is very clear and very straightforward? I believe for that same reason, that's why we are doing what we are doing. The lesson has to a twin pillar to it, if you like. The most beautiful part of that lesson is what we have looked at when we all spoke together, discussed together, and that is the message of salvation. We want everyone listening to us as we review this lesson, as we study this lesson, to know that that is the most important part, salvation of souls. And more especially when it talks about steps that we need to take to be saved. That is our desire when we meet together. And it has been our prayer that all sinners, not just only adulterers, but all the sinners, in the name of Jesus, today they will hear the voice of Jesus that will tell them, after they have confessed their sins, instead of being condemned, Jesus will say to them, I will not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen. That's one part. I think the second part is a subtle one. And that is the one I will really focus more on. And that subtle one has to do with even those of us that are claiming that we are now saved. In terms of how we live our life, how we uh, relate, how we uh, uh, deal with the enemy when it comes around to steal our salvation from us in a subtle way. And that is the angle that I'm coming from today, which is on a good advice. A good advice, judge not. My um, prayer is that if you're a child of God and it has been your attitude to be judging others, condemning others, talking about others, while you are thinking all the time that you are okay, that through this lesson today, in case you don't know you are in bondage, that God will free you today. Yeah. All these people came to Jesus, but only the condemned was justified, while the self-appointed judges, they left with shame and condemnation. May you not live with shame today. May you live with experience setting from heaven that your sins are gone and even the one that perhaps the enemy has driven you into in terms of talking, judging, uh, uh, finding fault with other people, Jesus will free you today. One of the problems of these professors of religion has to do with the way they see themselves. And then um, when you see yourself that you are right, when you see yourself that you are okay, it's very easy to transfer your own standard of being okay to judge other people. 
Now, that's not God's standard. It's your own standard. And one should be very careful not to judge others based on your own standard, but we use the standard of the word of God. I want to believe, just like we studied recently on the topic of forgiveness, that this is another way that the enemy is using to trap God's children, to make them feel as if they have not done anything wrong, when in fact they have offended God, when in fact their names have been taken off the book of life long time ago. But I, I, I just thank God that um, he's a God of mercy. Amen. He's bringing this lesson for me and for you. He loves everyone present here and all of you listening to me on the webcast. God wants all of us to make heaven. Amen. And he wants to do everything possible to defeat the plan of the devil, the secret plan of the devil to make you feel all right when you are not all right, to make me feel okay when I'm not okay, so that we can fall on our knees and call upon him, and he will have mercy Amen. upon us Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. These two verses that I've read, they are most quoted and most commonly misinterpreted in the Bible, and it's a weightier lesson. I want to pray that God will deliver me, God will deliver you, from judgmental attitude. Yeah. It's an attitude that we need to shed. It's an attitude that we need to take away. We need to do something about it. We need to cry to God to have mercy upon us. And I know the Lord is able to do that. Yeah. That judgmental attitude can come in the way of condemning other people, giving evil reports, accusing other people, finding fault, judging people according to appearance. God is going to help me to clarify this. And I'm praying for the spirit of God, the greatest teacher that we teach every heart in the name of Jesus. We don't want to judge people based on appearance. That will not be righteous judgment. There is a righteous judgment. There is unrighteous judgment. And we want to pray today that God will deliver us from unrighteous judgment. More especially, if we read verse 2 of um, Matthew chapter 7, that, that, that is a sobering scripture. It should keep us very sober. It says, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Isn't that great? And with what measure you meet, as old English, with what measure you measure to other people, it shall be measured to you again. God is the one that will do that. And that is why when we want to meet out, when we want to measure out any judgment, in quotes, whatever we want to say to somebody, let us remember this verse all the time. You are using a big drum to pour out judgment on other people. This verse of the scripture is saying that is the way God is going to do it to you. You're taking something very casually, and I'm not talking of sin here. I'm talking of uh, uh, you hear somebody has done something. Even when you have seen something, you might not have seen the whole picture. And the way you want to judge such a thing, you're just like, well, I may not have, perhaps I didn't see everything. You know, it still doesn't mean that you condone sin, but you do it in a way that I may not be guilty, of that particular thing, but I'm guilty of something else. When we view things like that, the way we measure out uh, uh, um, judgment, in quotes, we, we temper it with mercy. That's a sobering uh, uh, scripture for me. Whatever I do to other people, God is saying here, be careful. I'm going to do the same thing um, to you. Before I go too far, I want to make some clarifications about judging others. To judge in the New Testament has two connotations. Judgment, as used in the New Testament from time to time, uh, refers to two things. The first one has to do with discernment. 
It has to do with differentiating. It has to do with distinguishing. Actually, we make this judgment all the time. Every moment of our lives. We have made judgment this morning. The fact that some of us opened our wardrobe this morning and I decided to pick this suit against my other suit, I've made a judgment. I have made, I have distinguished. I have tried to do something that other suits could have spoken out. It's me, it's my turn today. You have not won me for a long time, but I just decided this is the one I want. We, we judge all the time in terms of the way we discern between things, the way we discern, the way we separate things, the way we distinguish one thing from another. We, 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 we make judgment um, from time to time as we do that. We do that all the time. Let me quickly say too that even Jesus Christ in this same passage alluded to that kind of judgment. Because what do you think Jesus meant? If you look at, let, let's look at um, verse 6. Look at verse 6. Give not, Matthew 7, 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Verse 20. Verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruit ye shall know them. Verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. How do we know all this? We are making judgment. When we talk about fruit, when we talk about the dogs, when we talk about um, 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 the good fruit, you are, you are making judgment. You are making discernment. You are discerning good from bad. There's nothing wrong in that when we do that. Let me also clarify and say that when Jesus Christ is saying judge not, he wasn't referring to the office of the judge, the magistrate, the ministers, those people that are put in charge that cases must be brought to and they must look into it. Jesus Christ is not saying anything about that as far as this lesson is concerned. He's not saying that young people you want to study law, Jesus, Jesus is not saying, you remember the Bible says judge not. And when you study the law now, you, be, you may be a lawyer, you may be a solicitor, you be a magistrate. That's not what Jesus Christ is saying. There's nothing wrong in that. We need judicial system. If we want to operate very well, God put them in place. After all, a whole book in the Bible is dedicated to the judges the judges, that God was raising from time to time, what were they to do? To judge, to, to look at matters, to look at issues, and help people to resolve things. So Jesus Christ was not talking about um, things like that. It doesn't mean that when there is sin, we keep quiet. Mm -mm. You remember the case of um, Moses and Jethro? When this father-in-law visited Moses and he found out that Moses was the only one judging, judging small cases, big cases, then he, he advised him, don't be the only judge. Have some over 10, over 50, over 100, and the big matter they will bring to you, small matter, they will judge. To judge, as far as we are concerned in this lesson is not talking about that. Jesus Christ is not saying that when he says, judge not, or he that has not seen, let him cast the first stone, as some people will allude to. Jesus Christ is not saying that anything goes. Anything goes. You can do anything you like, whenever you like, how you like, because nobody should judge you anyway. Nobody should face you and tell you that what you are doing is wrong anyway. Many people will use this verse in attempt to silence others trying to help them, trying to correct them, a job that we must do as Christians. But immediately they turn to you, who made you to be my judge? Who asked you to be judging me? 
when we are doing what God expects us to do to each other as brothers and sisters. I think that would be a wrong interpretation. We must know that there is a point when we must confront sin in the life of our brother, in the life of our sister. If we don't do that, we are failing to obey the process that Jesus Christ was teaching in the book of Matthew chapter 5 and the one that Paul was explaining in 1 Corinthians 5 and then to the uh, a Galatian church, where he talks about where you somebody who is weak, where he talks about somebody who is doing something, what you're supposed to do. That is not judging. We need to understand that. We don't want to be hiding under the cloak of, I don't want to judge, or you are judging me. Not to then do the work that God has given us to do as brothers and sisters to each other. I guess where we miss it, and in my limited experience, where we always get it wrong, many times some of us are interpreted as judging, when truly we are not judging, but the way it is coming across is like judging. And that has to do with our way of expressing ourselves. And I want to pray, I don't know how to do it. I'm praying to God to help me. And I want to pray that God will help us. So that when we need to be of help, to correct, to assist, to support, to point something out in the life of a brother or a sister, God will give us the language. God will give us the words. God will give us the wisdom. It's not even everything that we say anyway. Is it everything that some people see they must report? Is it everything that people see you must talk about? No. I heard that contributed by one of us here in Bexley that said that I, I like to go and pray. And that is always a good thing to do. Pray first. God can say, leave that to me. God can say, go and say it. Then you tell God, how should I say it? Help me because I want to gain my brother. I want to gain my sister. I don't want to go in my own way because if I say it in my own way, he, she may misunderstand me and truly it may look like I'm judging him or her. And God will see our hearts and he will surely do something. Um, about that. So when we are corrected, don't let us take it as judging. It is a correction, and God will help us to know how to do that. Amen. Christians are often accused of judging or intolerance when they speak out against sin. Opposing sin is not wrong. There's nothing wrong if you say, I don't agree. And we are talking of what God himself has called sin, not your own definition of sin. And even when you are to do that, remember, that is to be done in the spirit of love and um, meekness. What God has called sin, we must call sin. When we are trying to separate truth from error, we are making judgment, we are discerning, it's a discerning aspect of judgment, and God expects us to do that. We are to make righteous judgment. If you read again, John chapter 7, verse 24. John chapter 7, verse 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So there is righteous judgment. May God help us to do that. You wonder, what did John the Baptist do when, in the case of Herod, in terms of letting the king know that you are adulterer, you are in adultery, you are living in adultery because you have taken someone else's wife, he was just only making a righteous judgment. Even though he had to die for it, he was making a righteous judgment. When we preach the word, as we have in 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, where we are admonished to preach the word, to rebuke, to reprove. When we do that with the word of God, that is righteous judgment. What the word of God says, we have to do. What the word of God says, we have to repeat. In our lesson of today, it was clear that the Pharisees were not doing any of this. They were not. They were only proving to be righteous. And um, of course, we are righteous 
this woman is not righteous. When they know in their heart, of heart, that something is wrong um, with them um, as well. I think there is a caution here. For those of us that know how to go about and talk and judge and speak about even the bad thing that you have seen from your uh, uh, co-Christian, I think there is a caution here. And that caution seems to indicate that you judge at your own risk. Remember that. That judgment that you are carrying about is at your own risk. And God knows about it. And God sees it. Uh, verses 3 to 5 of our text in that, um, um, the book of, um, um, the book of um, John. John 8, thank you, 3 to 5, describes and the Pharisees when they brought this woman to Jesus, and then they were quoting the law, and they were saying, this is what the law has said, it should be stoned. What do you say? What do you say? You saw in that clip, and I like one contribution somebody made here in Bexley, about writing down on the soil there. May God write good things about you today. Amen. May he write something good about me. As a lot has been said about what could Jesus, what, what was he writing? They were asking a question and it's like as if he's not listening, as if he wasn't with them, just writing. Just writing. And then they started asking, aren't you going to answer? You know the reason? If Jesus will say yes, he's in trouble. If Jesus will say no, he's in trouble. If Jesus will keep quiet, he's in trouble. Jesus must say something. But Jesus, the embodiment of wisdom himself. May God give us wisdom. Yeah. It went straight. Many of us, we just look at the, what the law says. That's the way we will interpret the law. What people are wearing, what the, the way they are showing up and things like that. Jesus used the touch light of the spirit of God to enter into, to penetrate into their heart. And was able to see that, come on guys, you are just hypocrisy. It's all hypocritical what you are doing. Because as you are condemning this lady for the seventh law of Moses, you are in effect even committing immediately right there the sixth law and the ninth law of that same uh, uh, Ten Commandments of Jesus. Let's look at that together. The book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. Verse 14 is what they are taking. Exodus 20, 14. That's what they were taking. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The seventh law. We are catching her. She's, she has done it. But look at number six. Thou shalt not kill. Can you see the contradiction? And we want him to be killed. In their heart. And then the ninth. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You see, if you think about this adultery, with which we have defined at the beginning of our lesson, where, with all this crowd, did all this crowd, did all of them, did they see this woman in the very act? Did they? Maybe they just said somebody, he has committed. Oh, oh, he has, he, he has done it. He, he has done it. Hey, who, who, everybody then, ah, ah. Somebody cannot even say, mm, mm Who saw her? Are they sure of what they are saying? Even if it is true, this is an open shame. Does it mean that this is the only woman? None of us here has done anything like that. It's even worse now for you and me, isn't it? When Jesus Christ said that, 
You don't even need to do anything to anybody. Just down deep in your heart. You may be inside your room, lock yourself in your room, and you may be committed. As far as the standard of the word of God in the New Testament is concerned, that look of yesterday, that look on that your screen, that look on that advertisement board, that look on the street, when the enemy will bring it back, maybe immediately, the blood of Jesus. And then tomorrow, or when you are sleeping or something, oh, you see, remember that picture? And then you got carried away, oh yes, like this and like that. Jesus said, in your heart. A higher level, isn't it? Yeah. May God help us to be very careful. And that's why Jesus Christ was pronouncing, whoa, 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 whoa. May that not be our Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 23, everything was, whoa, whoa, whoa on you people. Hypocrisy, hypocrisy, hypocrisy. Just to be behaving holier than thou. I'm better than you. I'm better than you, the way you carry yourself. May God deliver us from that. Amen. When you see things, when you hear things, be quick to believe innocence. God's children, I'm warning you. I'm advising you. Be quick to believe innocence. When, when you hear things, more especially when it is hearsay, more especially when you haven't got a, a, a evidence in your hand, more especially when it is from a third party, be quick to believe innocence. God will deal with it. Don't worry yourself. Don't say, if I believe innocence and then something will happen to me, nothing will happen to you. That is coming from the enemy. Believe innocence. We are talking of God's children now in terms of um, when things happen and how they should approach it. Be slow to pronounce guilt. Be very slow to pronounce guilt. When evidence is scant, um, you know, in the judicial system, when evidence against an accused is inconclusive, what do they do? Even in the secular judicial system, that person is free until they can find anything that they would describe as beyond reasonable doubt. That's what is in the law. How much more among God's children? Until that demonstration is done. One of the founding fathers of the United States, his name is called Benjamin Franklin, who lived in 1706, to 1790, said something that I think uh, is not a quotation from the Bible, but I love it. I love to abide by it. I love to practice it. And I want to share that uh, quotation with you, which I've asked to be uh, uh, projected for you to, to, to ponder on. He said, I resolve to speak ill of no man. Are you listening? Is that biblical? not even in a matter of truth, but rather by some means excuse the faults I hear charged upon others. Is that biblical? Yes. And upon proper occasions speak all the good I know of everybody. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. To me that is food for thought. If we find ourselves guilty of this, please, I believe God is bringing this for my own good, for your own good. If you don't live by principles like this, I pray that God is going to help you and I today to pray for the grace to change and be sure we are like this. To speak ill of no man. Can anybody do like this and say, me? I have not. We are all in the same boat. And that boat today, in the name of Jesus, Amen. we are coming out of it. Amen. If you want to remain there, remain. But I want to believe many people from today, they will come out of that boat. Amen. That is what I think one may call charitable judgment. It doesn't the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, 
that charity believeth all things. Do you have that charity in your soul? Do I have it? And I'm talking of God's children now. Charity will believe all things. Until anything, until that thing is proved otherwise. When people come to you to say something, do you give them that kind of benefit of the doubt? I believe that was touched during the um, course of the lesson. When in doubt, keep quiet. When you are in doubt, something is not very clear, they'll be telling you, you are not saying anything. I have nothing to say. It's my usual expression for those that deal with me. Can't you say good or bad? I have nothing good to say about this, and I have nothing bad to say, because I don't know what to say. Keep quiet. Jesus Christ is coming, and he's coming very soon. And the enemy of our soul knows that. And he will do everything possible to get you, to get me, to the extent that we may not know when one's name will be removed from the book of life. When we still be thinking I'm there. You may be preaching as I'm doing. You may be singing. You may be teaching. I think it was mentioned in the teaching. We don't get to heaven by doing all those things. We only get to heaven as a result of the application of the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins. And may God help us about that. Amen. You know, somebody, someone also has said that um, <laughs> judging a person does not define who they are, it defines who you are. Judging a person is not, when you are judging someone to me, you are not defining who that person is. Really, you are defining yourself who you are, because you are just a busybody, you are the one that we just want to talk about somebody else. You know at times when some people are talking to you, you just bow down your head like this and be praying. You'll be saying, what do I want to say to this now? How can I respond? What, what will I say? More especially when it has to do with, can we call her? Oh no, sir. Oh no, ma. Uh -uh. All these things that you have now said to me, what do you want me to do with it? Some people are carrying baggage of rubbish. Don't let them come and drop it in the soil of your heart. For it may be difficult to remove. It may be difficult to take away. Judge not. We should leave the ultimate judgment of others to God. God has not called us to do that. Judge not is an elaboration of the golden rule. Judge not is an elaboration of the golden rule. And I find this very interesting. Uh, the two of them, I believe they are saying more or less the same thing. Um, when you talk about the golden rule that all of us know in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, if you read that and read Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, we will see judge not, and immediately in Matthew 7, 12, it has something to do with a uh, golden rule. And I want us to look at the way these two are put together. It was in, the, in a book, Running with the Giant, written by John Maxwell. He shared something that a new pastor shared with, the, uh, with his congregation, and he brought out eight points. I am not a new pastor, and maybe I'm a new pastor. I want to say the same thing that this man brought out to his congregation today. Let's take them one by one on this matter of judgment. The first one, if you have a problem with me, and I'm saying that to you, if you have a problem with me, come and see me privately. I will do the same for you. Is that okay? Yes. Can we start to adopt that from today? Yes. Can we start that from today? Yes. Not only with the pastor, but with your brother, with your sister. Can we start from today? Can we shame the enemy from today? Yes. I'm not going to carry it around again. Jesus, forgive me for carrying it around thus far. But from now on, if I have a problem with you, I will come and see you privately. And we will do that for each other. Number two, if someone else has a problem with me and comes to you, send them to me. I will do the same for you. Is that okay? Yes. Don't listen. 
You have problem with John. Why are you? My name is Isaac. Go to John. If someone else has a problem with me and comes to you, send them to me. Go to John, and I will do the same for you. Should we adopt something like that? Yes. Is this a good thing to adopt? Yes. Let's be Christian. Let's wake up. Let's, let's be matured. And God is able to help us. Amen. We can be true Christians. Yes. If I am failing, let me admit I am failing. If you are failing, admit you are failing. But the word of God cannot fail. The third one says, if someone won't come to me, tell him, say, let's go see him together. If he's thinking that I, I can't go to him, he's, uh, he's uh, or she's uh, whatever, tell that person, I will follow you. I will support you. I will be with you there. Because people will have 10,000 reasons why they will not go. You want to encourage them to be able to go. Four, be careful how you interpret me. I'd rather do that for myself. It's too easy to misinterpret intentions. And I will also be careful how I interpret you. Is that all right? May God stop all interpretations. We just interpret. He didn't say it exactly word for word. This is my interpretation of what you said. And then we, we, we confuse the whole thing. I will do that for you. Do that for me too. Don't interpret me. If you don't understand me, ask me. Instead of putting interpretation or my behavior or my action or what I'm saying. Number five, if it is confidential, don't tell. All right? If you or anyone else come to me in confidence, I won't tell. But there is a caveat here. Unless they are going to harm themselves, then I'm going to tell. Unless they harm someone else, then I'm going to tell. Or a child has been physically or sexually abused, then I'm going to tell. Otherwise, I expect the same from you. Is that okay? Yes. Something confidential, keep it confidential. Don't, don't, you know some people will come to you, uh, it's only you I'm telling. There's nothing like that. It's only you. By the time you hear it, but it's only me, and I'm so sure I've not said this to anybody, and the whole world has known about it, and it's only me she told. Keep your confidential matter confidential. You are the one who determined to make it confidential, so let it remain confidential. Six, I don't read unsigned letters. Do you know what that means? I don't read unsigned letters. If I do, and it's about you, I will check with you. You know some people, they will write um, anonymous letter? Anonymous letter. Um, this and that and this and that and this and that. This, this pastor says, you know what? Immediately I see uh, something that anonymous, I don't want to read it. Where is it coming from? What are you saying? That you cannot come forward and say and if it is about my brother that I have to read, and I saw Isaac Adigo has done something, so, oh, 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 I saw one name here, even though it doesn't come from anybody that I know. Isaac Adigo, be careful, I saw. Something has been written that you are this and that. If Isaac Adigo has done that, you better quickly confess and do something about it. And if not, just say you didn't do anything and leave it like that. God is going to vindicate you. Yeah. Number seven. I don't manipulate. I won't be manipulated. Don't let others manipulate you. And don't let others try to manipulate me through you. Is that a good advice? Yes. When it comes to judging others, listening to others about others? Eight, when in doubt, just say so. If I can answer without misrepresenting something or breaking a confidence, I will. When in doubt. You know, all these eight rules can be reduced to one thing. It can be reduced to the golden rule. Do unto others the way that you expect to do to you. 
you, you judging somebody by the way the person is behaving or acting, and you are saying, what a witch is, what a wizard is, tomorrow they will call you that name too, unless you repent. As he come to you to say, I come to confess to you, I, I was a witch, or I'm even in the witch now. How many people have used in coming around to say that? And when people say things like that, I say that, how do you know how they catch witch and wizard if you don't know all the process about it yourself? But more than that, they will call you that name tomorrow. You are enjoying it today, calling somebody that name, and people are calling it with you. Tomorrow, when they will call you that label that you have put on people, that name you've put on people, you know, the Bible talks about um, when somebody is treacherous, by the time you will stop, then your own will start. May God deliver us. Amen. The golden rule. I've said that when we judge others based on our, on our own heart, we see ourselves in others, we overlook our own faults and sins and failures, and then we see that of other people that is hypocritical. And as long as we hold on to our faults, we will see them in everyone else. If I'm holding to my fault that God is asking me to change and I'm not changing, I will be mirroring that. I will be projecting that to other people. What does he say? Something small in my eyes, something very big. You know, when I'm looking through that big thing and then I see that thing that is uh, very tiny in the eye of my brother or my sister. But because I'm looking through this big thing, the projection is this big thing is transferred to that person and I'm seeing something big. When in fact, that something big is from the projector. Unto the pure, all things are pure. Hence, we should first of all be sure we look into ourselves. These people were accusing someone, they are judgmental in their attitude, their judgment uh, um, was sinful, unrighteous, hypocritical. When it has to do with other people, we like to apply the rule. If it is other people, this is what the law says, this is what the rule says. When it is about me, about us, then we excuse ourselves. We say, well, then we start to rationalize. Then we start to give interpretation to things because it is about me now. I have to find a way to get myself out of it. But if you are talking about another person, yes. yes. Is that not what they were doing? Kill her. Jesus, what do you say? This lady should be killed. All of us will remember that's what happened with the case of King David after he had committed adultery and God saw it from heaven. And God sent messenger to go and meet David. Instead for David, David got what Nathan was saying. He knew in his heart that I have done something like that. But this one that you are saying, Prophet Nathan, ah, that person must be killed. We must do something to that person. Thou art the man. If you look at life like that, that I am the man, it's me. A songwriter say, it is me, O oh Lord. It is me. Rather than just looking at other people, looking at other people. If David had said that, Prophet Nathan, this thing you are saying, I know you are reporting a case to me, but you know what? I've done something similar. But now he says that person should be killed. So which means he's saying that I should be killed. But he won't say that about himself. If it's other person, let him be killed. If it's me, mm, we can look at that again and see what happens. When we see something about our brother or hear or know something about our brother or our sister, let's check how we react. Remember who to cast the first stone? He that is without sin. Who is qualified here? Who is qualified here? He that is without sin. One by one, they are throwing that stone. That stone. That stone. They were very honest. In our review on um, Friday, one teacher said that they were very honest, but that honesty did not carry them 
through to experience of salvation. They were honest to know that, mm, mm, stone drop, I know myself. Instead for them to cry and say, Jesus, have mercy upon me. They just went away like that. May you not go away like that today. Amen. The Bible says that he that thinketh that he's standing, take heed, lest he fall. Allow, allow God's word to judge without adding our own motives, our own speculations, because we will continue to judge after the flesh. It's only God that we judge after the truth. The self-righteous judgment of the Pharisee did not help them. It did not help anybody. If you have a genuine concern for someone who is going the wrong direction, and you think you have earned, and listen to me carefully, you think you have earned the right to address that concern. I love that word. If you think you've earned the, 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 the respect to address something that is going on in the life of somebody, that just simply means that it's not everybody that will just be addressing this one is this, that one is that. That will make you a judge. But it is possible that you can have a genuine concern and you want to do something, be sure you do it in the spirit of love, not judgmental or holier than thou. And always remember the measure that you use for other people, God is going to use for you. We don't condone sin. Jesus did not say to this woman and give her a pat on the back. Oh, it's only a sin of adultery. It doesn't matter. Uh-uh. Sin is sin. Whether lying, whether um, cheating, whether adultery, whether fornication, Jesus did not condone that sin. Jesus did not ignore ex or excuse it or tolerate it. But the point here is that we pray and make righteous judgment. Before we go on our knees to pray, let me ask you these questions. As we go on our knees to pray, let me put these questions up for you to look at. Number one, when you hear something negative about somebody, do you repeat it? If so, it may lead to unrighteous judgment. Do you repeat it? Do you believe it before checking to see if there's any truth in it? If so, it may lead to uncharitable judgment. Do you give benefits of the doubt when you hear something about your brother or your sister? If not, it may lead to impaired judgment. Do I judge others based on their actions and judge myself based on my intentions? If so, this may lead to harsh judgment. Do you jump into conclusions before investigating the facts? If so, it may lead to ignorant and untrue judgment. Actually, the book of Proverbs says that he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it's a fully and a shame unto that person. Another question. When someone's behavior doesn't reflect a choice or decision you will have made, are you quick to comment? If so, it may lead to superficial judgment. When people don't move at your pace or do something not the way you want it done, do you peg them as lazy and worthless and get agitated or irritated? If so, it may lead to self-righteous judgment. Do I condemn others about similar error, mistake, or sins that my conscience convict me of? If so, it may lead to blind and hypocritical judgment. In conclusion, Romans 4. Romans chapter 14, beg your pardon. Romans chapter 14. Verses 12 and 13. Romans chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Isaac, Adigan, we give account of himself. All of you listening to me today, you will give account of yourself. Not to human being, but to the righteous judge, God of heaven. Verse 13 says, 
Let us not therefore from today in Jesus' name with God's help let us not therefore judge one another anymore. We have been doing it before. Let's put the enemy to shame from today. But judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's or his sister's way. I will not do that. You will not do that. And if you have been doing that, we can say, God, like that woman, as we said, did. What did she do? She just resigned. I'm finished. I'm a goner. There is no way. I don't want to defend myself. I did it. I want to believe that the Spirit of God will be telling some of us, you did it. You are doing it. It's part of your attitude. It's part of your behavior. He'll be telling all of us, we want to do what that woman did by saying, have mercy upon me. She didn't cry out. We didn't hear what she said, but damn deep in her heart, I want to believe she was already crying. Have mercy upon me. I am a sinner. Please release me from this bondage. If you will deliver me, I will not do that again. Do you want to go on your knees and tell God that? I'm inviting you to come to the altar and let all of us fall on our knees, cry to God that will help us, forgive us all that we have done, forgive us um, the one that we are even doing right now, and give us the grace so that from now on, no more judging others, no more accusing others, no more finding fault with others, but follow all that the Spirit of God is telling us to follow by the grace of God. One is our master, the blessed Redeemer, for those of us to sing. Thank you.